Is Hollywood and current news media setting the stage for a shift in UFO pop culture? Writer, producer, co-host of podcast Need to Know and former CNN correspondent Bryce Sable joins me to discuss how Hollywood has played a major role in propelling cultural feedback loops within pop culture surrounding the UAP topic. Join us as we get Rebelliously Curious. Bryce, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious. I've been so excited to have this conversation with you because you are one of the perfect people to talk about culture and pop culture within entertainment, Hollywood, uh, connect and connected to the UAP subject. So thank you for being on the show today. Hey, it's my pleasure. I, you know, I love to talk about UFOs. I love that I get to work in Hollywood. And when I get to combine them into the same thing, I mean, I'm in heaven. So thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. So let's, let's start off from the beginning. How did you find yourself working in Hollywood? And then how did you find yourself drawn to the phenomenon being attached to Hollywood at the same time? Wow. Uh, two good questions. Let me break them apart. How did I first end up uh, in Hollywood is that um, I was a CNN correspondent when I came to Los Angeles. And then I ended up working as an investigative reporter for the PBS station here. And then that show got canceled, which sounds like a very Hollywood thing, right? And uh, uh, the woman I was dating, who is now my wife, Jackie, said, you know, maybe you should tr try writing a screenplay because I was getting ready to look for an anchor position. God knows where I could have been in Buffalo or Indianapolis or who, you know, just an itinerant anchorman, you know, have briefcase will travel. And uh, I had never seen a screenplay before at that time. So I looked at it and thought, well, that looks doable. I wrote a script. Uh, that script got me an agent at CAA. That agent at CAA ended up selling the script, and they made 108 episodes of that pilot that I had written uh, up in Canada. And, and so I just thought, well, as long as people keep paying me to do this, I'll keep doing it. And they, they, they did keep paying me. So that's how I'm in Hollywood. Now, the UFO question is slightly different because one of the things when you first get to Hollywood or, or start making it in Hollywood, people do want to hear from you. You're you're young, you have ideas and they want to know, well, what what are you thinking about? So you're always sort of trolling, looking for a good idea. And uh, I had always, uh, I guess, paid attention a little bit marginally to the UFO issue, but I did know a good story that had drama in it uh, regardless. And um, I think... Around the time I'd read Whitley Strieber's book, which would be 87, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be an interesting story if the government knew that Whitley Strieber wasn't lying? And so they they took his house and they wired it up so that the next time he was abducted, it would trip and then they could try to shoot down a UFO. And so I wrote that script and that script became uh, something known as official denial and became the Sci-Fi Channel's um, first full length film. And so that was that was a good thing. And I thought, well, I need to keep reading on this. I, I, I didn't I wasn't reading on it, actually, because I thought it would be another great Hollywood you know, sale. I just was intrigued. It just struck me as um, I guess I had one of those moments uh, late at night, about three in the morning where I'm reading, trying to make my script authentic, where I realized, damn, this stuff is real. And so I just kept reading. And that led to. Dark Skies, uh, the TV series I'm most known for in the UFO world uh, on NBC. So those how, how that all came together. That's great. And, and so Dark Skies was in 1996, I believe, when it aired. And you have an right. amazing story that's associated with Dark Skies when you were filming. Can you tell us a little bit about that, about what happened to you? Uh, because it was not say paranormal, but it was something connected into the UFO world. And I'm not sure if you can correct me or not, if it was government or whoever it may be, sure. we'll use the word men in black for now. Um, yeah. But please tell us a little more about that story. 
But one thing uh, that we'll probably end up talking about is people wonder if it's the chicken or the egg did. Is Hollywood being manipulated by the government to do material to get people ready for disclosure? And, and, and or is Hollywood simply reflecting what the reality is out there in the world? So those issues aside, um, I created Dark Skies in uh, in 95, I think, with my co-creator, Brent Friedman. And uh, we were lucky. You know, we got a show picked up. NBC ordered uh, six episodes, ultimately shot 22 hours of it. And um, so flash forward to the opening night, premiere night of Dark Skies. Uh, that was would be September 21st of 1996. And uh, I'm still living in this house here that I'm, I'm currently in today. And we had a party for the cast and crew. So that was about 200 people. You know, 200 people, but I knew them all coming to my house, right, to uh, to help to to see the show and to, you know, uh, all share that moment together. And I'm the host. So I'm running around doing things hosts do. And one of the uh, uh, writers on the staff says, I think you need to see this. And he points me over to my own barbecue and standing at the barbecue is my partner, Brent Friedman and his wife. And there's a guy there. I don't know who he is because I know everybody else because we made all these cool little um, majestic 12 identification badges. So everybody that came to the party got a little MJ 12 badge and it was just for fun and, and cool. This guy does not have a badge on. He's the only guy that doesn't have a badge on. He's the only guy I don't know because everybody else is either a network executive, a studio executive, an actor, a producer, or on the uh, cast or crew. So this guy basically says, and he, he's about a 30 year old kind of preppy, not so different than what I'm wearing right now, kind of a sport coat and collared shirt and that kind of thing. And he basically says that he likes our pilot, uh, but the people he works for wanted to help us out. And that raised two questions for me. Question one is, well, how can you like our pilot? It hasn't even aired yet. And he said, well, we've already seen it. And me being a, a wise ass at the time, I said, well, if you've seen it, what happens after Lone Guard sees the, the crop circle? And he goes, well, that's when they take him back to the Majestic 12 headquarters and perform the thing to take the ganglion. And I said, stop, stop. That's what happens. Which meant that before the thing had aired, somebody had seen it and, and dissected it. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible. There's lots of pilots that get shot in Hollywood that other people see, but usually, usually not outsiders, usually not strangers, usually, you know, friends of producers and executives. And I, I, I said, well, what, what do you want to do? And he said, well, we think you got a lot right, uh, but we'd like to help you get more right. And it, it turned out that he claimed that he was from the Office of Naval Intelligence. So this guy says um, that he works for the Office of Naval Intelligence and that uh, they've seen the pilot and that they want to help us out. Now, by help us out, uh, they wanted to, they, they, he told us some of the things that they thought we got right, but they wanted to, uh, you know, give us other information that might help us put things into the show that would be more appropriate or whatever. I'm a little skeptical and I'm a harassed party thrower, right? So I'm trying to be socially, uh, to, I've got a show coming up within the hour. I've got 200 people in my house and backyard. It's kind of hard to have that kind of conversation with a guy. And I'm about to throw him out. And he says to uh, Brent's wife, do you have a piece of paper or anything? And she pulls out a checkbook and pulls a piece of paper out and he takes it and he grabs a pen and he starts writing on it and then he turns around and shows it to us and uh we said what what is that it looks like a mathematical formula and he says well sound light frequency it's the secret of the universe now i i don't know if that's a true statement or whatever but that's what he said now I, i'm sure we talked a little bit more some of the details are hazy about that although there were five people who witnessed this guy at my party at my barbecue i threw him out i said well you know that's very interesting but um you know i don't know you and you weren't invited and i have people who were invited here that need my attention and we're about to show our pilot uh you know that's airing on nbc right now so you need to go so i threw him out and um 
So there was that. That was the sound light frequency thing. Brent gets a call from him a few days later saying, you know, your partner seems a little prickly or what, I don't know how he described me, but like he didn't appreciate probably being thrown out. And, uh, and Brent said, well, you know, I mean, he's throwing a party, et cetera. And the guy says, well, maybe he needs a little more confidence. Uh, he said, maybe I should bring my boss out. You guys want to meet? And so Brent set up a meeting with this guy and the guy he said was his boss. And they came out to the dark skies offices, which I allowed because we had security. And I thought, well, I have security. So whatever, we put him in the conference room. And these guys, I will say, did not look like uh, losers who are in their parents' basement, you know, sending texts, uh, you know, or being on UFO Twitter. Well, there was no UFO Twitter for them to be on back then, but they looked like lean, hard military guys. And usually if somebody's trying to con you, they're really being kind of obsequious. They want you on their side, right? This guy he brought acted like talking to me was the biggest pain in the ass that he'd, he'd had that week. He, he, he looked like he was there under protest. And they proceeded for a couple hours to tell us some of the things they thought was right about our show or what they thought was wrong. The thing they thought was really right is that we set the whole show at Majestic 12 and that Majestic 12 was run by the Navy and not the Air Force, which I thought was interesting. What well, we they also, didn't like- Just to pause though too, don't, don't yeah. we, we've heard that Majestic 12 wasn't real. There, there's some people that believe yeah. that Majestic 12 is, and then there's obviously the FBI has proved that those documents are fake. And that well, Majestic 12 didn't you say exist. that. Yeah. I, I don't buy that the FBI has proved anything. I, I buy that somebody, uh, when they released it, wrote bogus all over it. But that doesn't prove that it's bogus. In fact, I think over the years, uh, I have under option Stanton Friedman's book uh, detailing his investigation to the documents uh, called Top Secret Magic. And I, I was I thought it was pretty strong then. And I think over time, even when this latest JFK dump of documents, there's certain things that lead you to believe that maybe we've been too fast to dismiss them. Anyway, um, they thought they that we got that right. Uh, and maybe maybe my memory is hazy and maybe all they thought we got right was the the Navy versus the Air Force. But that was pretty radical in 1996 for people to say it's the Navy in charge, not the Air Force, because everybody, well, if you'd ask anybody, they would all say the Air Force. Right? Well, right. And look what look at today. Look at present. Day. And look at today. And uh, right. what they didn't like is we had a thing where we said that the the hive, if you will, that which, which was the alien invasion force in dark skies. Um, they were a, a, a ganglion that infested somebody's brain and then took over, right? He said, that's not what happens. That's not the way it works. And to which I said, well, it doesn't matter how it works. It's a TV show. It's a dramatic TV show about an alien invasion. Anyway, this went on, like I said, for a couple hours. And at that point, I thought, you know, um, I got a show to run. And NBC and Sony, which was producing it, don't give a rat's ass if I talk to a guy that wants to help us on our show, because I don't need him to write shows for me. I don't want him writing scripts. I don't know who these guys are. So I threw him out again. I just said, <laughs> you know, I, you, you're gone. Have you seen him since? No. And um, there's only one other final piece to that. I'm sorry. This is the short version that I'm telling you. No, it's you. okay. I'm, I'm no, sorry it great. goes on. But the third part of it is that a few more days go by. And, and again, this uh, first guy that showed up at my house for the party, uh, he chose to talk to Brent, my partner, instead of me, which is no surprise. I'd thrown him out of my house and I'd thrown him out of my office. So I suppose he probably felt I was not the guy to call. So he called Brent. And I thought it was interesting because, you know, most people would just give up at that point. And he said, your partner looks like he really needs persuasion or words to that effect. And Brent said, well, you know, I mean, you're asking a lot. And he said, well, um, listen, uh, the big guy or some version of that uh, is going to be in Long Beach on a ship and um, he'll meet with you guys. And so we were thinking, well, that's kind of intriguing. I mean, don't know what that would mean, but how would that work? Now, here's the part that's going to make you just gasp and go, well, that's what, this is just insane, makes no sense. And I'm not defending it. Remember, I'm just telling the story as 
it happened to me. I'm not lying or misrepresenting what happened to me. I'm just, but I'm also not taking responsibility for what somebody might say or do, right? So in other words, what I'm about to tell you is insane, but I'm not making it up. This is what was said. What they said was, well, okay, the way this works is you'll meet in Long Beach. Uh, you can't come on the ship for obvious reasons. Um, we'll meet you at a cemetery at midnight. Okay. What? And at that point, I said, well, that's it. Um, I got three kids and a wife, and I'm not meeting anybody at a cemetery in midnight. It's never going to happen. Forget about it. And I've never heard from them or seen them or read about them or anything since. So that's, that's the dark, that's the short version of the dark sky story, which by the way, I should tell you, I am writing a book this year and I'm going to tell the expanded version in that book because it's fascinating. You know, even if it's, if, if it was all a setup, it's fascinating to me well, anyway. I mean, it was exactly. odd that it happened. Well, yeah, and exactly. And, and I wanted you to tell that story because it makes you the perfect person to talk about UFOs in Hollywood because you've had those experiences. You've obviously worked with the content, but you've had something right. almost to like this men in black, you know, government experience that's coming and looking to influence or manipulate your content. So yeah. the one question I have here, and I have so many, so I was flipping through before um, the one, <laughs> ones that I was going to pick, but sure. looking at, there's some here saying like, we look at the Hollywood UFO conspiracy concept, right? Because we know that the Robinson panel, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, looked to use entertainment in Hollywood yes. and other media outlets, right, to, to influence and use a disinformation campaign. Do you feel that that may have been part of that, uh, that experience that you had with those men? Uh, and also, do you think that maybe instead they were trying to, um, we'll use the word acclimate uh, people right. to the idea of UFOs. And I don't want to use the word alien because we'll talk about the separation sure. of that too within mainstream yeah. pop culture. But do you think that there was something of a misinformation campaign or maybe an acclimation of this sure. topic within using your content to push that forward? It's a super valid question. And um, while I don't know the answer, I will say, let's just break down the possibilities. Uh, you laid two of them out. One of them, it could be disinformation. It could be acclimation. And it could be fraud. You know, it, it could just yeah. be uh, some people who had too much time and money on their hands said, let's create this world and let's go to these crazy guys and, and tell them this story. Um, the, it wouldn't... It, and frankly, option one and two are both possible. It could be acclimation and it could be disinformation at the same time. It, it's not impossible. I know a lot of people would like to believe that there's some grand plan uh, that the government has been pursuing over the years to try to slowly acclimate us to the existence of uh, UFOs and, and potentially alien life forms and so forth. Uh, so I couldn't put it past uh anybody as a possible explanation. I just, I just don't really know, but I will tell you this. Um, when it was happening at dark skies, I didn't feel anything other than it was real. It felt very authentic to me. Now um, I didn't have time to do what I would do as a journalist today. I didn't have access to the internet and I didn't have time because what I would ordinarily do is I, I would have demanded you know, full ID and resume and everything from these guys. And I would have, uh, I would have looked into them and I would have called in some of my journalistic friends and we would have worked them up pretty good, but there was just no time. I mean, when you're producing, it was 20 hours of uh, television at that point, you know, that's more work than any human being can really do responsibly. It's just too much. And so I didn't have time to think about it, but um, my take is, that it's probably a little of both. I think the government possibly, there seems to be evidence in the early days that some of the things that were uh, in the ufology of the moment were being uh, put into films in the 50s. And there are there is some evidence of some meetings between some people at some times on some of those early movies like The Day the Earth Stood Still, Earth versus the Flying Saucers, some of those kind of things. Um, and that that apparently happened. However, despite my story, I still 
have to always put the cautionary flag up there. Because if I know anything about Hollywood, it's like people in Hollywood aren't out to, you know, make a movie to make a message. And they're certainly not willing to be pawns of the government. So if somebody is putting out information uh, to producers, uh, I, I don't think it's common. I also would have to think that um, they don't need to. All right. One of the things that happens all the time is in Hollywood, we all know that what the studios want to buy is drama and drama equals conflict. Well, what's the greatest conflict you could come up with? Uh, there's something happening. I don't know what it is. And I need to find out that's good conflict or there's something happening. And I know it's an alien invasion. Well, that's conflict. Right. So I don't think any government entity has to go to any producer and say, here's a great idea. We want, we're going to pay you money and we're going to give you inside stuff. If only you'll do an alien piece, because I think there's probably 500 writer producers in Hollywood right now who would probably do an alien piece without the least bit of uh, pushing to do it. And certainly that's true of me. Um, but there have been cases and it's probably not um, impossible that some of that has happened. Now, the question that I ask now is when we look at Hollywood UFO movies, are directors and producers using this to fictionalize this topic or are they using it to actualize uh, it or potentially both? See, well, everybody's different. Um, from my own point of view, um, I'm a former journalist and I guess I'm not a former journalist. I'm still a journalist. I'm a trained journalist. I've worked in journalism. So when I, uh, one of the, one of the things I like to think is part of my brand and writer producers do have brands in Hollywood. I want people to think their brand is Bryce tries to get it right, that he does his research and he, he immerses himself in the, in the world in order to create a realistic world. And I'm willing to do that, whether I'm writing a crime drama or a hospital. The first thing I ever got on TV was about a female surgeon in New York City. I'm not female. I don't live in New York and I'm not a surgeon. Right. But I researched the hell out of it. And by the end of it, I thought I pretty well did know what it was like to be a female surgeon in New York City. Right. So I think a lot of people would be like me. Uh, if you're going to write about UFOs, you're going to do a deep dive and you're going to read a lot of books and read articles and surf the internet, talk to friends, et cetera, et cetera. So most people are going to be able to find the, um, you know, the, the basics and then try to weave them in dramatically into your script. I mean, that's what happened to me with official denial. I literally read what was available at the time you know, fed it in here and watched it come out there into a screenplay that, uh, let me put it this way, while it was, it was kind of an odd film that we shot down a UFO, it's clear now that the government has shot at UFOs. So I didn't make that up. And the guy was an abductee. And I made sure I got those details right, not just from Whitley Strieber, but from uh, the Bud Hopkins work and, and, um, and the like. So yeah, it was a dramatic piece, but it also was well researched. And so the answer to your question is um, most people, most writers would like to write stuff that feels authentic. The people who change it are the executives, you know, frankly, the right. whether it's a studio or a network executive, they'll look at that script and they'll say, you know, I just have one note here. And the, the classic is there's a book out called Would a Martian Say That? Uh, and it's studio notes that people have gotten over the years. I've gotten notes like that. I do think that executives don't give a damn, most of them, about what the reality of UFOs is. They they want to pump it up, right? They want to they want to have that conflict. I was just, for example, uh, uh, a subject matter expert on um, a Discovery uh, Plus Channel documentary this year, a two part documentary on Betty and Barney Hill. And you know, I've uh, I. I'm very into that story and I know a lot about it. I've done some original investigation on it. And so I was telling the producers, you know, there's some theories about this that, you know, you may not be aware of, blah, blah, blah. And what I was told by the producers was, oh, 
listen, Discovery doesn't want anyone to raise any doubts about the alien nature of this, because the people who are watching this, they all believe that it was an alien abduction. So don't do anything to raise questions. Well, you know, that's not a really responsible way to do it. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody at Discovery. It's just another way of looking at it. I look at it as a journalist. Some people look at it as, well, what are what's our audience want? So there's two ways to do it. What should I say that accurately reflects the status of this issue? And the other is, what does an audience want me to say about this issue? And frankly, you know, if you want to sell and be commercial, you try to do a little bit of both. And I agree. I'm like, and someone telling the story, I think in both ways of, you know, what might be factual and what not is the way that right. the story should be told because we look at entertainment as a mechanism that has influenced the UFO conversation and along with pop culture and how we sure. view UFOs and obviously any form of ET or extraterrestrial concept or idea. So yeah. my question then is looking at, yeah. do we have, so pop culture has really put into our consciousness the idea of UFO and UFOs and aliens being one. Now, yeah. is that a mechanism of pop culture? Because what's happening right now that I see within news media and even within around the UFO community is that people do obviously still connect them. So on a side note, when I talk about UFOs, I don't really talk about extraterrestrials. I'll bring it up in a conversation, right. but I focus on the, the broader conversation of UFOs and what's happening academically and currently and in the past. And so and look right. to bring it obviously into a modern day conversation and, and hopefully a more academic conversation. But my friends or people I know are like, oh, Chrissy, she's like that alien girl or Chrissy likes the, yeah. is the alien stuff where I'm right. like, no, it's UFOs. So is that a mechanism of pop culture that we've auto on, uh, automatically have put UFO and aliens in the same bucket, but right now they are very different because we know that we have potentially the American government saying is that it's multiple players. It's not just one. So maybe it isn't ET, maybe it's, uh, you know, interdimensional. We don't know. There's tons of theories, but is that a mechanism of pop culture? And well, do you think that's going to change over time where there's all of these different theories will become individualized rather than clumped into one. There's, I think the answer, just speaking off what, what I feel after studying this for 30 years is I think the answer probably is a little bit of the above or all of the above. I, I, I think it may not, I, I still would bet if I had to bet, I'd say part of this is alien. Yeah. I think, I think the evidence that I've seen would cause me to believe that, but but I don't, but your question goes to the heart of, well, are, are, are we just accepting that as part of the narrative that Hollywood feeds back? Is it this feedback loop that Hollywood says are aliens? So now people talk about aliens, et cetera. Well, I guess I'm an exception to that rule already because uh, official denial, the first thing I ever wrote about aliens, aliens that got produced by the sci-fi channel, they're not aliens. You get to the end of the film and the main character says, well, where, you know, um, where do they come from? And, it, and the guy says, not where, when. And that's at the end of the film. They're time travelers. They're us. Right. So I think people are willing to accept that something strange is going on. And I think people are willing to accept that these things probably are not just flying around by themselves with nobody behind them. It's not impossible that they're unmanned or un unalienable or whatever it's possible that they're just the machines that are like high-tech drones it's possible but i think there's some some life form of some kind uh behind them and i would bet money that or not even bet money i'll just state it as a fact the government knows more about it right now than we do because for close to eight decades they've not been sharing their work They've been looking into this according to all the reports and all the documents that have come out through Freedom of Information Act and so forth over the, over the years. They've been taking it seriously. They've been looking into it. They've been pouring billions of dollars into studying it. So they know more than we know. And I would like to see that redressed, not just to the public, but in Hollywood. I think there's a, a lot of different ways to look at it, but they should share their work. That's what we should be talking about right now. So one of the things I'm doing, uh, Chrissy, just to, to try to overcome what you're talking about there is 
Uh, well, I, I could spin a good UFO story any day of the week to people, uh, just make up stuff. And, you know, I, I, I've got the, the, the stuff residing in my brain to do that. Uh, I tend to, these days, want to tell stories that are based in cases that are sort of factual. So, for example, I have one project called The Crash that's about Roswell, and it's got uh, the option to witness the Roswell by um, Don Schmidt and uh, Tom Carey. And it also has Stanton Friedman's top secret magic under option. And I, I would like to make that because I, first of all, I think crash wreckage is probably the, the story of the next year or two that 100%. might possibly break out. And I'd like to be there, you know, with, uh, with the, cr with the crash, same thing with captured because um, the reason I'm drawn to Betty and Barney Hill is that, Right now, if you were to say, you know, Bryce, but see, I've been abducted repeatedly over the years, I'd say, well, maybe she has. But on the other hand, she's read a lot about abductions. You know, she might not have been abducted, you know, I mean, and things that she's saying, you might have got from some other source. But Betty and Barney Hill didn't get their story from anybody else. Maybe they made it up. But if they made it up, they were clever writers, because Nobody was talking about it when they went with that. So that's kind of how I come down on it. I, I think it's time to start telling some stories that are, uh, th that are from the headlines that are informed. They don't have, of course, you're going to take dramatic license. I'm no stranger to doing that. I will continue to do that. But it doesn't mean that I don't want people coming out. If people come out of, if, if I can find someone who will fund the crash and people get to see that movie, when they walk out, they're going to say, let's go have a drink and talk about this thing. How much of this is true? And they're going to start reading the books and they're going to know more about it. So, um, you know, that's one way to look at it. I think it's great because you're right. These type of movies that or documentaries or any form of popular culture that's done in television or film, it educates people when we're looking at trying to show facts rather doing factual right. than entertainment. So I agree. It's a great way to start a conversation. So people then are interested in the UF into UFOs and they kind of jump into this UFO community, which, you know, it, it's still very large right now, but it kind yep. of is for everybody. You know, I always laugh when people say, "Oh, I'm not in the UFO community." I'm like, "Well, you kind of are." I'm like, "We all really are," and it's all we're all in the UFO in community, right? If you're interested in it, and if you like it, if you're a skeptic or not, you know, uh, it's uh, you are you are in the community, I mean, and it, it is a growing. You are, but on the other hand, yeah. I, I know where your friends are coming from. It, it, when yeah. that, when uh, look. Um, I, I literally wrote a book about UFOs, AD After Disclosure, and I can tell you that I don't think my wife or my three kids have read it, right? So, I, you know, I just think that we, it, times are changing in the five yes. years. It's now the five-year anniversary of that New York Times article. Things have changed, um, mostly for the good, in that we're now talking about it. The community is larger. There's a uh, uh, more stuff out there that people can get their hands on that would lead them to, you know, think about what's going on. But a lot of this was already out there. Um, but from a dramatic point of view, let me just give you one other example. When I said I'm willing to just run with something, uh, I've got a scripted podcast called Undeniable that I've um, developed and written already uh, for Jeff Sagansky, who is, um, he was the executive at Sony that greenlit Dark, uh, Dark Skies. And uh, he, he was also the head of CBS for a while. So, and he knows a lot about this issue and, and abductions. So uh, what that piece is about is something that is sort of pulled from the headlines. There is a concern. If you read the, um, the June 25th, 2021 report, the preliminary report on uh, UAP, one of the things they talk about is a fear is a mid-air collision. Right. So I ran with that. I said, well, how can I put that on its feet? How can I make that come alive? Because I think it could happen. So that's it almost what did in Canada. Is. Yeah, it yeah, almost did exactly. in Canada. Yeah. So it was a commercial airliner flight. Yeah. Is the news is a newscast from the future when they're covering a midair collision. And once you start covering the collision, then suddenly the eight billion people on our planet all kind of at the same time come to the conclusion, holy crap, this shit is real, right? And then that's the change of consciousness that we're on the cusp of. What's happening right now, and I'll use a Hollywood term for it, is, um, you know, in Hollywood, you can have a hard cut, 
or mm -hmm. a slow dissolve. And when it comes to the public waking up to what's going on with UFOs and UAP, we are in what I call a slow dissolve right now, where every day, a few more people, every day, a little more information. And slowly but surely, we're getting to that place where we're going to wake up one day and most of the world's going to go, yep, yeah, that's, that's real, unless something happens. And that would be the hard cut, a collision between an aircraft uh, a human aircraft and a UFO that of unknown origin um, would be a hard cut because you would go from, well, the world is this way today. This thing happens. Now it's this way. Right. And, and I, I don't know where the world's going to go on this. It could go either way right now. I think from a slow dissolve point of view, we're probably five years or less in my opinion, wow. from a hard cut point of view. You know, while we're busy recording this, we could get off and, you know, go check out a web, check out CNN or Fox or MSNBC and go, oh, my God, there's a UFO that crashed in Buffalo. You know, we, we don't know. We just don't know what the future holds for us. But um, it is fun to have a job where I get to speculate about it. I will oh, say for that. sure. Yeah. And time will tell. And back to what we were saying about, you know, looking at it as a subculture, because it's what it is. But I really think that we're moving into this counterculture, that it's it's more of a movement in its space, because that's yeah. what countercultures are. They're movements. So we're looking for a movement of truth and trust and honesty, right? That's what we're looking for. And, and if people use the word disclosure or not, I don't like to use it all the time, but you know, we're, we're looking for more transparency. That's what that is. You know, over the moment of pop culture, we've had these catalyst moments that have moved UFOs into mainstream pop culture. There's tons of them. So nobody's right. Sure. <laughs> because I have asked this question to other friends and other people I know. If you had to pick, because you've worked in, you work in Hollywood and you've been around this sure. and you're around news, working with CNN as a correspondent, if you had to pick the catalyst moment where you were like, this is one of the definite spots, or it, it can be multiple, that this is a moment that this moved the, the UAP topic into mainstream, what would that catalyst moment mm. be or what would those catalyst moments be? Well, I, I guess you'd almost have to define mainstream because if I, 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 I'm the son of a history teacher and, and I, I think there's ample UFO history of just thousands of great cases going back. So, and, and from time to time, we have moments where it seems like it's about to break because everybody's talking about it. You have the Hudson River sightings, you have, you know, whatever. You have Roswell when it first broke and all that. And then it kind of gets put back in its box. So I don't know. I don't know when, but the, I, I will say this. I used to use the word disclosure a lot. In fact, I wrote a book as using it, AD after disclosure. I think the better word right now is confirmation. And I use that more often because I think what, what people, I, I don't think people expect the government to just say one day, you know what, we're sorry. Here's a, uh, here's a hard drive with four gigabytes of video and photos and documents from proving that UFOs are real. Thank you. Have a nice day. Not going to happen, but what the, what might happen would be confirmation. That's what I'm looking for where somebody official says, yeah, you're not hallucinating. Uh, these things are not only physically real as we admitted, but they're not from around here. We'll get back to you with with the details later. I think we may be on that. Now, I feel like I just started talking and I almost forgot what your question was. Your no, question it's okay. was- I'll give you yeah. an example. I'll give you an example yeah. of what I think those yeah. moments were when we moved in from counterculture sure. or a subculture, depending on how people want to categorize the UAP topic into mainstream, you know, it's 2017 sure. and the New York Times piece that broke, right. you know, the, and let's be honest here, the New York Times and Life Magazine has covered UFOs in multiple sure. outlets, the Chicago Sun in 1947. Yep. So there's been tons of these little, you know, little media nuggets that have come out with UFO coverage. But I think that real catalyst moment where people from 
the banking community that I've talked to or yeah, sure. people in finance or people within mainstream media or, you know, Steve on the corner, that's like, whoa, the New York Times is saying that the government is confirming that these things are actually happening in airspace. So I think that and was it a big wasn't one. just the yeah. New York Times, though, because oh, now the sure. government has actually confirmed it in writing that they're 100%. physically real. They just haven't right. taken us. But, you know, just to go back to your question, then there have been a lot of points and you just brought up one. The Kenneth Arnold sighting in 1947 is uh, a month later, uh, followed by the Roswell uh, right. admission that we we got a craft and then they pulled it back the next day. But that entire summer, I call 1947 the summer of the saucers. All right. Because you, you could hardly argue that it was a secret and that people really didn't give a damn about it. I mean, the United States was on fire talking about flying saucers in 1947. Everybody talked about them. And for about the first two or three weeks after the Arnold sighting, they were treated in the media fairly respectfully. There were a lot of media articles that would that seemed to say, yeah, uh, legitimate people, these police officers, these radar operators, they're all seeing them. And it wasn't until about three weeks, four weeks after that Kenneth Arnold sighting where it began to get peeled back, where they began to start saying, yeah, but probably these people are crazy or they're drunk, right? And that stuck. Right. And, um, and it has stuck with the larger population, except for anyone who's seen one, right? People that have seen one, they don't you know they 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 learn not to talk about it all the time but if you talk to people that have actually witnessed a close up personal interaction with one of these things they don't think we make them they're pretty sure we don't and they're not shy about telling you what they saw and in most cases what they saw doesn't look like any kind of aircraft that we make around here so sure. it remains a great mystery. And I think people are compelled by a mystery. Uh, certainly, um, you know, well, I mean, to, to do the Hollywood metaphor, the mystery has kept a lot of things going. I mean, the mystery is what fired up Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You know, For that sure. wouldn't have been the hit. It was, if two things, it wasn't a genuine mystery. And there weren't a lot of people out there that had actually seen him. Oh, yeah. You know, that's why, sure. it why it became popular. Um, oh yeah. So amazing film and opened up so many doors of conversations and, and obviously brought it into the, and the mainstream through entertainment, I would say not through yeah. news, but brought it through entertainment and Spielberg is just a genius. Let's be honest in so many ways. Yeah. Back to the news conversation, sure. because you, you did, you know, work at CNN as a correspondent. Yeah. Do you think that UFOs are embedded now in our news cycle and are here to stay? Mm hmm. Well, yes, they are embedded in here to stay, but only because they're authentic, right? If there's a way to bifurcate that question, they're authentic. But what has struck me is the persistence of journalistic snobbery about the topic, right? Um, you would think, for example, we've just passed the National Defense Authorization Act. The House passed it. The Senate passed it and the president signed it. And it basically says, we're going to bring whistleblowers forward. We want to know everything there is about crash wreckage. We want you to find everything that going back to 1945. And we're, okay, this is a major deal, right? So if I'm a reporter working for a major newspaper or, or network, why would that not be a story? Your own government has voted to devote time, resources, and money to finding out what the story is about these, these objects. Why are they not writing about it? Why hasn't that been on the front page of the New York Times? Why, why doesn't uh, uh, Fox News lead with it? Why doesn't uh, CNN do a 10-part you know, investigative series about it? Why? And the only answer that I've been able to come up with is the the pillars of the cover-up, uh, which go back to 1947, possibly before, are um, basically uh, ridicule and denial. And I believe that after that summer of the saucers in 1947, particularly with Roswell, 
the people in charge said, you know, let's go with this denial and ridicule thing and see if we can buy ourselves five years to get a handle on this. And what happened, it worked better than anybody had ever thought, uh, leading to, as you started this conversation, Robertson panel and other places. But the denial and ridicule turned out to be so effective for reasons that probably have a lot to do with just human consciousness. But they were so effective that even today, when there is actual evidence staring you in the face, most journalists are like, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that. Uh, my editor's going to think I'm crazy. Yeah. And we've seen, which I would say, yeah. tell your editor to read the freaking NDAA, but they still don't like to cover it. I hope that's changing. I, I there are signs that it's changing on the edges, but, uh, what journalism tends to do right now is um, sort of the quick hit. So, uh, if you're when that report came out, the the, the um, preliminary report on UAP. Uh, by the way, it came out on a Friday at 4 p.m. and and Dolan and I predicted in AD after disclosure that if, if there was going to be any big admission, it would come on a Friday af afternoon because you would want everyone going home for the weekend and you would want the stock market closed. Exactly. Anyway, so, so, uh, you know, I, I just question why people are still behaving this way. And I think it, it, in years to come, when we now understand that the phenomena is real and it ain't us, and that at least some of the things in our skies are being, and our seas are being flown or navigated by somebody who's not us and from somewhere that isn't here. Um, historians and journalists are going to look back at the days that you and I are living in right now, and they're going to see this little conversation we're having is almost quaint. They're going to say, look, these guys were still sort of, you know, trying to slay the dragon. You know, it seems oh, yeah. so obvious. Why didn't they know? And, you know, we'll, we'll be there saying we did know, but nobody else would talk about it. So I, I, I think we're, we're, closer um but not there yet and i also just to go back to the theme of your show i don't think we should look for hollywood to to break the story wide open because uh, we know for a fact people love a good alien movie but it doesn't mean that they believe what's before their eyes and it doesn't mean that they believe what's in the news they just yeah. like a good movie where they can buy a tub of popcorn and chew it during the movie you're 100% right. And the synergies between news and entertainment are still very strong and they influence. We've right. seen that in the past, entertainment would influence news media, but it would influence tabloids as well, because this topic was always in tabloids. You know, yes. obviously it's becoming into the mainstream even more. We're having, you know, Politico speak about it. We're having the New York Times, the Washington Post. You know, everyone is talking about it to some degree in the mainstream, but the tabloids are still running this and, and to a degree. And I'll use things like oh, the Daily know. Mail and the Toronto and the, the Toronto Sun and this in the UK Sun. The reason why I say that is knowing yeah. as a PR person on my daily job is, you know, working within the UAP topic with multiple different clients. I see that when I'm pitching a story and I won't obviously call out some of these news outlets, but when I'm pitching a story to either the mainstream or let's just say of a, of a tabloid to a degree that's more respected, um, and we'll use that lightly, uh, right. what happens is I find out, and I've been told this personally from uh, media outlets that are from, that are larger for looking at like Fox, you know, CNN, NBC, sure. we're looking at those type of organizations, larger broadcasters. When I'm pitching a story to the mainstream and I say, Hey, this is what's happening. And they're going to go, well, we don't want that right now. And I go, well, this is who hmm. else is picking up this story. It's interesting that a major tabloid that I have either pitched has picked up the story and they have told me that from those producers, when that tabloid picks that up, come to us and then I'll show our producers. So right there, we're seeing that the mechanism of UFOs is still being, um, not in a way controlled, but still being influenced by entertainment to the mainstream because the mainstream is being influenced by entertainment and by those tabloids. And so it's for me, a, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. And it's a very, very delicate place to sit with the UFO topic because I shouldn't have to pitch a tabloid to get it into mainstream. You would think it should be the opposite. 
wouldn't you? Right. Well, it's yeah. it's FOMO, fear of missing out. You know, oh, yeah. you know this as a Good point. as a PR uh, a pitcher. You you know you want to you and you just illustrated it. If you can try to say to somebody, well, somebody else is about to get this, uh, you know, then then obviously they'll think about it. But um, what the the actually also on the tabloid idea, the National Enquirer over the years was portrayed as being you know just a Looney Tunes crazy town kind of thing that you picked up if you're in the grocery store standing in line. But the truth is a lot of uh, UFO cases that were actually good cases were broken by the National Enquirer. And the National Enquirer also had CIA connections, which we now know. So there's that. But what I was going to say about the journalism thing is, I think what we've seen with uh, this is not just mainstream journalism. It's also sidebar journalism. Um, the report comes out and they'll cover the report. Okay, this report says X, Y, and Z, all right? And um, that's good. It's a good start. But guess what? They don't follow it up. They just cover oh, no. the report. And then and then the other guy reads that report, that story of the report, writes it, and it, then it's over. If I was a, a, an assignment editor... And somebody filed a report on a government report that says UAP are real and they're physical and we don't know what they are. I would right. say to my best reporter, I'd call him or her in and say, stop what you're doing. Get on this. You have no more further responsibilities. Let's be the guys that break this story. So the idea now, I, again, not everybody's going to do that, but the idea that nobody's done it. Why? I it's don't know. It's this stigma that it's, it's denial and ridicule. The government has denied over the years. That part isn't quite over yet. They're, they may not be denying the, the physical reality, but they're denying that they're not earthly origin. So there's that. And the ridicule part has never gone away. You know, no, as, it, as we've seen- It will seen, be here to stay I, for a while, yeah. I will say this though, I, I, I hope your listeners and viewers haven't heard me say this before, but it's apropos of, of what you're talking about. Um, before 2017, because everyone in my circle knows I'm a UFO guy, right? My family, my friends. And uh, that's not always been a good thing. I mean, there have been times where I- have said that I get treated like the drunk uncle at the wedding. You know, people like, don't ask Bryce about UFOs. God forbid, he will, don't do it, right? And they don't treat me like the drunk uncle anymore. Now they sort of, I've got people that do come up to me, people who have never even thought about the topic, but they've seen something. They saw that report about the report in the Wall Street Journal or something. And that, like uh, one of them is a, a friend of mine who's, um, you know, I went to college with him, but, but he's now a, an a economic advisor for a, you know, a major company. Never talked to him about UFOs before. And now he's come to me multiple times and said, so what do you make of this? And he's read something. So we are starting that climb. You're right. And I think that for sure, I think the ridicule will probably still be around for a while. You know, when we're yeah. looking at misinformation or disinformation campaigns starting in the 50s and 60s, that's many generations, right? Or many sure. different people that are obviously not going to take this seriously. And it's going to take a while, as you said, in this dissolve. And I love that comparison, this dissolve, slow dissolve to other people to look at this differently. And for sure, you know, you don't have to say UFOs are ETs. You can say, I'm interested in the UFO phenomenon. Phenomenon and sure. what is the government saying and following that narrative. I think that that's perfectly fine. And it's a great place to start. Um, back yeah. to the, the tabloid piece. True. It, I, yeah. you know, it's interesting and I hope it does change because I've talked to other journalists and they'll make a comment. If I've pitched something, that's a larger story and a tabloid of a more respected one has picked it up, let's say, cause it's the only place that we're going to go and it would make sense for the narrative, but and to use it as a strategy, let's say, mm -hmm. for then larger mainstream media to pick it up, someone from like the New York Times. But I do find it interesting because back in the day, you would never really get mainstream media ever following a tabloid. It was really taboo and not talked about and just right. it's cringeworthy. But now you're seeing the opposite where you're getting tabloids that are actually reporting a little bit better than the mainstream and stuff that's maybe not as 
I guess, yeah, as mainstream as you would assume it would be, but they are pushing that sub this subject forward for us and mainstream then is following it. So at some point, I hope there is that shift. Like we do need it where I as a publicist can go forward to the Washington Post way before going to a tabloid too, because it's not always my number one spot to go. Well, let's be honest. <laughs> so have, I'd, I would rather absolutely. the New York Times pick up a story way before think, any things, other larger time. But, no you know, uh, Chrissy, yeah. things <laughs> have shifted over the years. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. I collect. Uh, I started doing this when I was at Dark Skies. I bought the entire collection of because it took place in the '60s. I bought every time in Newsweek from the 1960s. Right? Oh, did you? Wow, so nice. I could cross-reference UFO events in one column and and actual national international events. And when they lined up, I'd find stories in them. And so I've collected uh, Time and Newsweek since then. I have a pretty massive collection that I use for my own purposes, for whenever I need to write something. But I will tell you this, you do find UFO stories. You know, you think, well, Times never really covered it. Well, they have. They've covered UFO stuff, and so is Newsweek, and so is the New York Times, and so has a lot of places. What's different, though, if you look at the, you know, the timeline of coverage, is the coverage up until 2017 was predominantly skeptical, well, not predominantly, overwhelmingly skeptical. In other words, they didn't even cop to, well, they're real. It was always, there was another explanation. That was where you got weather balloons and swamp gas. And frankly, even in 2006, when an excellent witness looked up at Chicago's O'Hare and called in that there was something hovering there and it was structural and it was multiple people were seeing it. You know what the first thing they said to that person is, sounds like you've been drinking. Okay. Sounds like you've been drinking. Give me a break. I, if I'm that drunk, I'm going to pass out. I'm not going to see a UFO. I don't think people see UFOs because they're drunk, right? That tendency to be so dismissive, you know, you're either a hoaxer, a liar, or a drug addict to see a UFO. That's gone. That's gone. So what has happened now is the conversation has shifted so dramatically from a conversation was previously was, well, since these can't be real, there has to be another explanation for them too. Well, they are real. We just don't know what they are. Okay. That's progress. So I like to see the glass half full instead of half empty. You know, I'm too old right now to spend the rest of my life being, you know, just negative about everything. So the glass half full part of it for me is exactly that. We no longer are debating their physical reality. They're physical. Some of them at least are physical because people see them. There's radar returns and all this stuff that you and your uh, audience know. So we've moved forward. And the logical thing to do, if you think that something is physically real and you don't know what it is, is to investigate it. And what's fantastic right now is we don't have to wait just for the government to investigate it. We used to because they had all the best toys, but now we've got a lot of the same toys they have. Now, granted, they've got more aircraft flying around that are seeing things and recording, you know, we're recording that, but it doesn't mean that the citizenry itself can't participate in this great thing. And we have the internet, and we have the ability to share information. So I'm an optimist. Uh, when I say five years or less, the only reason I say that is because I'm pretty sure that there's a, a an authentic, authenticity to this issue. And something that's that authentic, you just can't keep swept under the rug forever, particularly when you've shifted the dynamic. So if we go back to how we started this, and these guys come in to talk to me, it almost, the, the fact of where we are now has over the years made me feel that what happened at Dark, Sky, Dark Skies is more credible, right? Because before, when it actually happened, I was, you know, part of me was saying, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm just a guy making up a TV series, right? But now I, I see that there is an authenticity to this thing. The government has certainly known about it and has done many, many, reports and investigations on it that they don't even like to tell us about. And so I do believe you can't keep that in the bottle forever. We're, we're going to find out.
I think that is the perfect way to end this interview. Thank you so much, Bryce. And as I say to all my guests, thank you so much for being rebelliously curious with me today. I am totally rebelliously curious. <laughs> and I am so happy to have been on your show and share some time with you and, and your audience. And thanks very much. I hope we'll do it again some other time. Yes, for sure.